Welcome to the Born Unbreakable podcast. I'm your host, Coach Des, mindset motivator and lifestyle entrepreneur. From lost trauma, disappointments, and devastation to healing hope and betterment, what has grounded me is my unbreakable spirit. We all have that spirit within us. Every week, I'm here to inspire you with stories of perseverance and growth. My mission is to help you crush self-limiting beliefs and to be unapologetically you. You are your only limit, so take action today. Let your unbreakable ride begin now. This episode is brought to you by Brossery. More than just bra straps, the accessory I love. With styles from dainty to daring, you will too. Click the link in the description or go to brossery.com and use promo code BUSHIP to get free shipping on your order today. Welcome everyone to the Born Unbreakable podcast. This is the moment I've been anticipating all week long because I have a really, really exciting interview for you today with someone that is really special that I got introduced to uh, from a friend of mine, Mafei, who's actually out in the Philippines doing some amazing work and you've heard her episode on my show. So today I have Scott Rosenfeld. He is one of Hollywood's most successful independent movie producers. So I basically have a legend here with us today. He's recognized for notable films such as Home Alone, Smoke Signals, Mystic Pizza, Teen Wolf, and Extremities. So think of people like Macaulay Culkin, Julia Roberts, Michael J. Fox. Home Alone is one of the most famous movies that all of us can think of. Scott was actually the executive producer for that, and it remains the highest grossing live action comedy of all time, generating over a billion dollars. Critical Thinking is one of his most recent films. I actually watched it recently. I was blown away. It's incredibly inspiring. If you haven't watched that film, I highly recommend it. It is about inner city kids black and Latino kids that form a chess team in 1998 from Miami Jackson High School and win the national tournament. And I just think it's a movie that everybody needs to watch. So you can actually check it out on Amazon Prime. That's where I watched it. Um, He's also had several documentaries, which include Seven Days in Syria and Standing Silent. He's working on a number of several productions right now, but I'll let him talk more about that. Some of his achievements recently are the Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2020 Lighthouse International Film Festival. He's internationally acclaimed and a member of the Directors Guild of America, the Writers Guild of America, and the Academy of Motion Pictures, arts and sciences, and his alma mater is NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. So there's a lot more I could say. I picked a few of my favorite highlights, but Scott, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And you did well. You, you, you went through a fairly long bio and picked very good highlights. I appreciate it. Good, good. But I do. I was. I was so excited about watching Critical Thinking that I just had to throw yeah. that plug in no, there. No, I'm. I'm glad because it's. Uh, it's the most recent film I've done, and I'm really proud of it. You know, I'm very proud of it. You know, we got hit by the pandemic in terms of you know a, a, a larger scale form of distribution that a lot of movies went through the last two years, especially smaller movies, not the big blockbusters, and uh, people are still seeing it. People are downloading it. People are watching it. We're getting incredible uh, reviews. And I mean, you know, it's, it's what we hoped. It's just, you know, the pandemic has changed how people watch movies. So mm-hmm. I really appreciate it when I hear that people have seen it because I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And, you know, John Linguizamo, I have to say, did an upstanding job. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I watched the little clip at the mm-hmm. end where you see, the Mr. Martinez, who was the the real Mr. Right. Martinez, and and um, I, I'm amazed. I love his work generally, and uh, it was you could tell the difficulty of you know what what was experienced during that time. I mean, we all see the challenge of socioeconomics today in America, you know, in 2021. So right. I can only imagine in the 1990s what that was like to yeah. have to portray that. So yeah. that was pretty incredible. Absolutely. Um, but I want to take you back 
And so this might be this might be a really interesting thought for you. But as I've studied your work, which you know, <laughs> I'm thinking back, Scott, to 1979, when you were an assistant production person for Van Nuys Boulevard. Mm. So that was like early <laughs> days, over 40 years ago. But what I want to <laughs> know <laughs> is, I want to know about young Scott. So Scott, before you even did that, what brought you to wanting to be in the film industry? What was your why behind that? Well, um, at, when I was in high school, I, you know, we had, we had eight millimeter cameras. We didn't have video. We didn't have the kind of video we have now. We didn't have the proliferation of young people being able to say, I'm going to make a movie, right? At, and they're they're 18 or 20 or 20, whatever. It just didn't exist. So, you, you we had eight millimeter cameras, which you actually had to edit the film. You had to know how to do that. So, you know, you had to be pretty geeky to be involved in film in high school in my era. And I wasn't. Uh, I was athletic. I was a good student. Um, uh, I like to write. And, and I had something in my head for a long time, ever since fifth grade, that I wanted to be a writer. Writer to me meant uh, novels, short stories, you know, that life. And, and, and then I started working in journalism in high school, both in the school paper and some other things that I did and won some awards. And it, I felt like it was something I did well. Uh, so I went to college for journalism. I went to um, Boston University, and they had a very good journalism school. And I got there, and I like Boston, and um, you know, I started getting into the school. But about my second semester, I, I was uh, a friend of mine uh, had entered a, a short story in a graduate level writing class, and he and I were friends. He was a freshman, and he said to me, "You should, you know, because he knew I liked to write." And he said, "You should, you should." send something in. I said, this is a graduate level course. We're freshmen. He said, send it in. What the hell, right? I sent the short story in. I got into the class like he did. Uh, so both of us were the two freshmen in a graduate level writing class. And that class, every week we had to turn in a short story. And uh, one, one week the, the professor said, you know, I just try your hand at a short screenplay, you know, 10 to 15 pages maybe. And okay, you know, I like movies. I watched a lot of movies. I enjoyed movies. It, 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 they weren't new to me, but it wasn't something I thought I could do. And that week, particular week, I, I, I wrote a little script like everybody had to, but mine turned out pretty good. And I thought, this is really actually pretty cool. I enjoyed it. So I looked around and at the time there was <laughs> no computers, no internet, no anything. We had these big books, you know, they're, they're, and people still probably have them. They're like uh, uh, eight by 11, but very thick, you know, like a, like a phone book. They were phone book style and it was all the colleges around the country. And, and they listed it by either, I forget, not geography, but usually by program or something, right? So you flip through it or, and, and I'm looking for film schools. I already knew, you know, in my head, I knew about LA. I knew about USC and UCLA because they were even in a sense more famous than NYU. Although I discovered that NYU was also like right there with the two of them. And I saw NYU and I, and I knew BU actually had a, a film program, but you didn't get your hands on the equipment till very, very late, almost your senior year. And at NYU, it was like immediate, like that saw, if I transferred your sophomore year, you'd get your hands on the equipment. And uh, I applied, you know, I applied as a transfer student and uh, got in. And um, once I got to New York, which is a place I always wanted to live, I grew up about an hour and a half from New York in Pennsylvania. I got to the city, I had an apartment with a friend. It was just like, oh my God, I've arrived. I've arrived where I belong. You know, it's, I felt like this is where I belong. And I got into the program, immersed myself in it, so much so that I graduated, you know, in two and a half years. I didn't even go a full four years because I went summers. I just, and part of it was I really loved it. And I took all my prerequisites, got them out of the way and just immersed myself in the entire, you know, film life. And also in New York, 
there's a lot to do in the film world. There's other things you can do. There's other classes you can take at other places that are, you know, um, uh, not postgraduate, but they, they didn't go to your, your, your uh, degree, but they're all over the city, right? It's New York City. And I went to art house theaters and watched movies. And, and, and it was the, the late 70s and people like Martin Scorsese were developing Coppola even, you know, had, you know, his work and uh, all that, all those filmmakers, uh, Hal Ashby, great films in the 70s, John Cassavetes. And that's what was the, the, the jump off point for me. Like, this is fantastic. And, you know, it, it was it was a way I, I, I guess I wasn't really made to have a job, you know, in a sense. <laughs> I, I, I know there's plenty of people who live nine to five and, you know, I have family members who do, and there's nothing wrong with it. I, I just kind of sensed, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do this. I want to have a different life and I want my work to be something I love, something that's a passion and something that's not a job that doesn't feel like a job that I feel sort of a privilege in a sense to be paid. And I, and sometimes, honestly, I still feel that way. I mean, maybe I shouldn't, uh, maybe I haven't been paid enough, but, uh, I still feel that way that my God, I get to do this. Right. And that's what it took off from there. And, and, and even before working as a production assistant in California, I had a year in New York after I graduated. And one of the films I worked on in New York was Saturday night fever. And I was a production assistant on Saturday Night Fever. And, and I also had a chance um, to be John Travolta's photo double. Now that now, of course, you know, people would laugh, go, oh, you're bald and, you know, you're probably heavier than John or, you know, but, you know, John's bald now, too. So we've sort of caught up to each other. He's a little taller than me and generally he's a little thinner. But at the time, I, of course, I had hair. And there was a certain style, you know, the style that he had, the way he combed his hair back. And, but I was kind of doing the same thing. And I, I, I looked just enough like him that the director looked at me on the set as a production assistant and said, uh, John's back in California, which was a big problem that he actually had left and gone back to California. We need some more work. We need all the stuff where he's sitting in the car, where they're driving like onto the Brooklyn Bridge. And these, these there's some scenes that people know about in the movie where the car like goes on almost like two wheels onto at the exit on off of the brook, you know, onto the Brooklyn Bridge and all this stuff. And it's me, it's not him. Um, so I had, you know, some great experiences in New York, but moved to LA in the summer of 1977. And I entered into that world of what was the end of this sort of, um, uh, the low budget filmmaking world was this drive in movie world. And it was New World Cinema, Roger Corman's company, which was pretty famous for making um, not so great movies, but but developing the careers of lots of people later on. They made they made what, you know, B movies. There's another saying, but they made B movies. And they, but but a lot of people came through their ranks. Great directors later, Coppola and Jonathan Demi and Scorsese made a movie called Boxcar Bertha for for Roger. And so Crown International was the the competition. And uh, I applied there to work as a production assistant on a movie, and they liked me. And and it was this film Van Nuys Boulevard. Uh, and you know they at the end of the movie they liked me, and they said, "Boy, you're smart, and you know what you're doing." And but I was still, you know, I was 21 years old, you know, 20, 21 years old. I graduated from college a little early. And I, I used that to start working throughout the system in L.A. And the next film I worked on, which was one of theirs, that company, was called Galaxina. Galaxina starred Dorothy Stratton, the uh, playmate who unfortunately was killed by her husband. And, you know, in the, we all know that story. If we mm -hmm. don't, I don't have to tell it here. But I worked on that film as a production manager and I jumped from being a production assistant, which is, you know, a gopher job to being a management job because, and I was very young and I was, but I was smart and I had paid attention and I followed stuff and I read stuff and I learned and I listened and a lot, you know, for me, a lot of it at that age was listening, not telling everybody how smart I was or what I wanted to do, listening to people who knew what they were doing, getting getting advice and getting education from people who are more experienced than me and listening, really listening. You know, a lot of times there's younger people. Sometimes you're like, Oh, I, 
I'm doing this job, but you know, I really want to direct or I'm, you know, you, you know what, it's okay to hear that at some point, like at lunch or maybe when the movie's over, but if you're hiring somebody, you don't want to hear that all day. And some people do that. And I knew better, you know, I, I knew better and people could see that I was listening and learning and paying attention. And, and it gave me, you know, I, I, I started to use that as a springboard into, into better work. I worked on a movie called Alligator, which was about an alligator in the sewers of, of, of LA, uh, those kinds of movies. But the thing is on that movie, for instance, my, somebody who worked as my PA was Gail Hurd, Gail Ann Hurd, who ended up producing you know, the Terminator stuff and, and has TV shows and is a major producer. And she was actually my PA. The writer of the screenplay was John Sayles, who was a fantastic, you know, indie uh, director and writer for many years. So that world spurned a lot of people, not spurned, you know, spurred a lot of people. Um, I also saw it changing. Drive-ins were going away, were disappearing. This sort of this B-movie thing was kind of like at the end of its run. And I started to feel like Maybe maybe there's a way to do quality movies for a small price, and not just and not just art house films, because there were some great directors, and I would consider John Cassavetes one of them, who was one of the few true indie filmmakers. He was a actor in Hollywood who 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 would work in major movies, but then would spend time writing and directing very indie movies, Husbands and Woman Under the Influence, and some brilliant movies. And, and, and I loved his work. And at the same time, I thought, well, there's also might be a way to do budgets like that, but make commercial movies. So I discovered a company. I saw this film called Valley Girl came out and it was almost like, it, it's sort of like evolution when things jump from, you know, the, the <laughs> monkey, monkey crawling to somebody standing up. And, but this company called Atlantic Releasing made this movie called Valley Girl. And it was Nicolas Cage, either his first or one of his first movies. And I, I watched it and I was like, you know what? They're doing, they get it. This is not, people are going to think this is a drive-in movie. It's not. It's actually a crossover into something that hasn't quite happened yet. That started, that picked up later with like Fast Times at Ridgemont High and things like that. But this was, this was a movie that came from, sort of the world of, of exploitation and B movies, but wasn't that at all. So I went to that company and I said, I like what you guys are doing. And it was a small company. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a production company that, that was funded. And I said, I like what you're doing. I think you're onto something. I have the same point of view. Let's figure out what to do together. And they said, okay. And they liked who I was. And we did a small movie together. Uh, and it starred Willem Dafoe and Judge Reinhold. Uh, it did okay. It didn't do great, right? But they liked the movie. They liked how I worked. Um, we were able to bring incredible talent. I mean, Willem wasn't Willem at the time. <laughs> he wasn't that known. But, um, you know, they saw how I could bring talent like that to these smaller non-studio movies. So mm -hmm. the next thing I knew, they, they called me up and said, we've been working on this project with these writers. It's called Teen Wolf we'd like you to produce it. And I jumped into that as a producer and, and, you know, we did a lot of work to get it ready to rewrite it, to hire a director and all of that. But Teen Wolf was, became for me sort of this pinnacle of doing an independent film, but a commercial movie. And, you know, up until then it was mostly art house at that level, at that budget level, not commercial. Now, Oliver Stone, other people were getting this too. Oliver Stone made Platoon around that time for around five million. Room with a View was made, and Room with a View was a little bit more of an art film. But both of them kind of were commercial movies. So there were other people who were thinking like this. You know that happens. You know I I, I don't think I was the only one. I can't be that presumptuous. But it, a, a movement was happening to make more commercial movies, but do them cheaply instead of the studio way. And that's what I did. I did that all the way up to, you know, for me, the pinnacle of that was Mystic Pizza, which was $5 million. It wasn't, you know, uh, Teen Wolf was just under two. 
but Mystic Pizza was five, and and we made it with an independent comp- a company, but it was an independent company, the Gold- Samuel Goldman Company. We were able to, and also at the time, we were able to do, which is very hard to do now, when we were talking about actresses to play the the, the sisters and the friend, you know, uh, we had every, every um, you know, Brat Pack actress thrown at us, the big ones at the time. And some of them have even called and said, I want to be in this, I want to do this. And, and I said to Sam Goldwyn, uh, you know what would be really cool to find new people? And he never, if you said that now, they'd throw you out of the room, you know, fire you or throw you out of the room. And Sam Goldwyn, to his credit, said, okay. So we found Julia, you know, we found Lily Taylor. It was Lily, Lily, Lily Taylor's first movie. Annabeth Gish, who played the youngest sister, had actually had more experience. She started working when she was like, I don't know, 10 or 12, you know, she, she actually had experience. Uh, but the other two had very little. Lily had none and, and Julia had done a couple little things. And we were allowed to do that. And, you know, and, and really the rest really was history. You know, we made this cool little movie that people still talk about. Um, and, and it really, for me, was the put, taking all of that time from leaving New York, getting to L.A., seeing this vision of independent film, but commercial independent film, to make a movie like Mystic Pizza with writers who were great. We brought in Alfred Urey to do a work on the script, who wrote Driving Miss Daisy. And, you know, it was great. It was this great combination of like, and I, and I started to say to people, this is what I do. And I call this A movie head, B movie body. And that's what I do. And, I, and the, the funny thing is, even though I, I then jumped into Home Alone uh, at a studio, uh, I still do that. I actually came back to that. When I, when I had a company in Seattle and made Smoke Signals, which is another film I'm tremendously proud of, and Critical Thinking, and, and even now in the Philippines with the movies we're doing, it's back to uh, A movie head, B movie body, which only means the, the cost of the film. We're not making $100 million movies. We're making, you know, three to five. I do have some movies that are 15 and 20, but even the movies that are 15 and 20 would be 50 and 60 at studios. But Mm -hmm. the bulk of some of the things we're doing in the Philippines, which is a lot of money for the Philippines, are in the, you know, three to three to six million dollar range, but they're international films. And they're designed Mm -hmm. as commercial movies, but it's still the same thing. It's A movie head, B movie body. And, 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 and I always like saying that back then it was a, I used to get interviewed a lot. I mean, long time ago and use that and, and people like that. And I, and I, I haven't said it in a long time and I might start using it again, but, but that's, how it should. but that's, that's was my maturation into, you know, uh, being an independent filmmaker, but also not exactly uh, being just a one movie um, art house director or producer uh, I have nothing against that, but but I just saw something else. I saw the ability to make commercial films for a price is what the saying is. And I did it, you know, and, and now I've also added writing to my repertoire, two or three of the projects that I'm producing. Um, I've written as well because I spent a lot of time working with writers and good writers and learning from good writers. Um, and, um, you know, I use those lessons finally in the last couple of years now that I've just turned 30 to, uh, you know, be able to, to also write, I don't write everything, but there are things I've always been passionate about. And this goes back to high school (laughs) when I wanted to be a writer and I felt like I can continue to produce, but I need to do also what was in my heart. And, 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 and I, you know, and, and you know, the thing, the thing, the, the one is, I'll tell you the one inspirational thing. I don't, and then we can go on to another question, but I think it's important on Home Alone. Um, John Hughes had um, requested, he wanted to meet because he had this project called Career Opportunities. It's a John Hughes movie. I, you know, good or bad doesn't really matter. I don't think it, it's nearly close to any of his best work. It was Jennifer Connelly and Frank Whaley starred in it. They were two kids somehow locked in a Kmart or something, if I remember right. And they were on 
roller skates and guys, people were coming in to rob the Kmart or something and they had to whatever. So John, you know, sent, sent me the script. It was going to be my first studio movie. And I had a partner, you know, a producing partner. And, uh, I read the script and I was like, Oh man, you know, I love John Hughes. I love all his movies to date, which included brilliant movies and, and, career opportunities didn't seem like that right so <laughs> but, but it was going to be potentially my first studio movie and my partner you know was less concerned about the script and just more concerned about the job and i he said whatever it just you know look i know you don't like the script that much but you know let's just get the job first right you know a lot of people do that in every industry so i uh, yeah, yeah, okay okay so we go into a meet we meet with john hughes john hughes is a legend you know, I've never met anybody at a studio. I've only done independent films and you don't, you don't have meetings in studios. You don't have all that stuff. And we drive onto the lot at Universal. We go into his office, John sits down and he just starts talking. He says, so, um, you know, uh, what did you think? Uh, you know, he's a little chit chat, but very little. He was not a chit chat kind of guy until he got to know you. And so what do you think of the script? Cause he's a writer. John was a pure writer. He was, he was a good director. He did. I don't think he loved directing, but he was a good director and he got producing credit. He really wasn't a producer. He was a writer. Um, and uh, I start to stammer a little bit. My, my, uh, my partner's sort of kicking me under the table already. And I'm like, um, it's a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's pretty good. And he looks at me cause even, you know, people were, like sycophants around John, to be quite blunt, you know, his people who work for him and others. And, you know, you want to, you think the guy always wants to hear you say, oh, yes, John. Oh, great, John. And sometimes that's not always the case. So he looks at me, he can read my body language. And when you go like, eh, you know, I didn't say it's the best script ever written. He said, no, come on, tell me what you really think. And I went, it's okay. <laughs> Just like that. It's okay. That's so funny. He said, he said <laughs> you're right. You're right. It needs a lot of work. And the director who we happen to know, a uh, young director, it was going to be his first movie. He said, Brian's already working a little bit on the script and we'd like you guys to tinker with it. And, you know, and we talked a little bit more about it. And, and, but I, I was really honest with him in that sense. I didn't tell John Hughes that his script was awful. I wouldn't do that. But, you know, I, I, he could tell, and I said, yes, and here's where I think it needs work. And, and then I realized I'm telling John Hughes that his screenplay needs work after all the great stuff he's done. So we leave the meeting, and uh, about a week later, his lawyer calls, because John doesn't usually do things, didn't do things personally like that. His lawyer called and said, look, John really enjoyed meeting you, but um, uh, he's going to hire somebody else to produce career opportunities. And I said, okay, all right, well, thank you. And uh, it was great meeting him. And my, my partner said, <laughs> you know, you screwed, if you had just not opened your mouth, you know, we would have gotten the job. And, you know, so two weeks like that went by and I was, I was like, should I, should I have done this? Should I have not done this? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have stood up for what I believed. And after it was about the third week, I came home one day. I was living in L.A. and, and I had a condo. And the fr at the front door of the condo was an envelope, was an eight and a half by 11 envelope. And, and uh, I got closer to it and I could see the Warner Brothers logo on the envelope. Now, I had also never gotten a script from a studio. Independent companies don't messenger you scripts. They just, you know, it does, they don't work that way. So I look at this package, I see the Warner Brothers logo, my name on it. I open it up and John had this habit at the time. Uh, this was 90, uh, 90. He had some habit because on the internet or something, if he had scripts going around with his, with the cover page, with his name on it, people were selling his screenplays and making money with his name on it or something. So John would send scripts around without a title page. But there was, a, there was a cover letter from this executive at Warner Brothers that said, John Hughes requested that you take a look at this script and call me after you've read it. Come in for a meeting. So I start reading Home Alone. I sit down, and I'm 10 pages in, and I'm laughing. Now, I'm laughing because it's funny, but I'm also laughing because I'm like, oh, my God. I was like, <laughs> it was like the scales of justice, you know. 
they were here, but career opportunities was down here somewhere and home alone was up here somewhere. And I was like, Holy God, what a difference. I read it. I called the executive at Warner brothers, went in for a meeting and the next day and he said, well, yeah, John really, uh, you know, we wanted you to take a look at it, you know, and this executive was older and Warner brothers always had older people. We were in our thirties and he looked at me and he was like, ah, you guys are all so young, you know, maybe we have to put older people around you or something. And it was like, oh, this guy's crazy. You know, like we didn't know what we were doing because they looked at independent film like it's the minor leagues, right? In baseball, like it's not even triple A, it's like double A. That's how they saw independent film. And I always felt that I play baseball and I knew it was like, they're looking at us like we don't, you know, we don't belong in the major league, that, that they're the major leagues and we're the minor leagues, right? So, uh, he, he, I go to, you know, he sets up this trip to go to Chicago. Now I get picked up by a limousine at my condo, which I'd never had driven to LAX, uh, first class airfare to Chicago, which I'd never had, uh, limousine picks us up at the, at the airport, takes us to the four seasons, downtown Chicago. Uh, <laughs> It was like, oh man, this, this you know, I, I could see why people get used to it. You know, you can see why people get used to it, which is a bit of a problem. Uh, and, and so I get into the room, I don't know, 10 minutes go by and John calls and he says, um, uh, I'm going to come by tonight at about six with the director and pick you up and uh, we'll go to dinner and talk about the project. And I said, uh, you know, I, and I say to him, you know, no one yet has told us who's directing. They keep saying, well, we'll let John tell you, or, oh, we don't be. And I said, who's the director? And John goes, oh, don't worry. You'll, you'll meet him. It, crazy. It's crazy. I still don't know who's directing the movie, you know? So six o'clock I'm in the lobby and John's walking toward me with, with the director, who's Chris Columbus. I knew Chris, Chris and I knew each other because we had both gone to NYU and we had, there were some groups in, in LA, you know, NYU grads and that kind of thing. We knew each other, like really knew each other. We weren't the closest of friends, but we knew each other pretty well. And and Chris goes, Scott. And I go, Chris. And John goes, oh, you guys know each other. And it, and this had been like almost three weeks of like everybody sort of hiding who the director was. And Chris goes, yeah, you know, we had dinner. It was great. Perfect. Talked about the movie, how to make it, the locations in Chicago, because John had just moved back to Chicago from L.A his family and everything. And he, uh, it was great. So I go back to the hotel room. I'm in the room, maybe 45 minutes go by the phone rings. It's John calling from his car. John, of course, being one of the three people in the United States with a car phone. And it was one of those that was attached to the car. It was like the, that heavy thing. And you had a handset and, but he had one, of course. Um, and I think he had dropped Chris off because Chris, Chris's in-laws lived in Chicago. So he had picked Chris up for dinner. He dropped him off at his in-laws home and he was on his way home and he calls me and he goes, you know, uh, that was great. And I'm really looking forward to you working on the movie. I, I just want to tell you when, when you came in for career opportunities, um, I knew that wasn't a good movie for you. I knew that was not the right movie for you. And I, and John Hughes said this to me, I wanted to find something better for you. And, you know, sometimes I have a hard time even saying that uh, to this day, you know, because of, you know, John, uh, there was a generosity that not everybody knew that he had. He didn't always exhibit it. Um, but to say that and to have that perception, which was absolutely dead on correct. And secondly, for me to have stuck to my guns and not have been, you know, uh, solicitous in that meeting. Chances are, if I had done what everybody else done, he would have go. Oh, he's another one who just wants to, you know, lick my boots, basically. And because I didn't do that, and because it all worked out, so I, I really like, you know, people should know, you know, you you should stand up for yourself. You don't have to be obnoxious, and I wasn't. You don't have to, you know, be in somebody's face because I wasn't. But if you have a conviction, it's going to take you further than hiding it or lying because that will always catch up with you personally and it'll catch up with, with the universe, you know, 
And, yeah. and this is an example of that. And I and I, I say this a lot to students and other people, to, to this story in particular, because it had so much resonance for me. Yeah. And well, and that actually brings me to my next question, because it's the very thing that you're talking about, of having that gut instinct, that feeling of knowing when something feels right is, what is that for you? At this mm. point, you've done decades of movies. And what I've appreciated about looking at your work is how diverse it is. There's a richness to it. There's, there is deep connecting stories that pull people in. And I'm just curious from your perspective, what is that it factor for you that says, yes, well, this is the movie for me? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I think I can describe sometimes what happened. I don't know if I can, you know, sort of uh, psychologically describe it. I can maybe describe it physiologically because I actually get a feeling. Um, and, you know, I, like when I, I moved to Seattle from LA and I was looking to do interesting stuff and find something that was interesting for the Northwest that hadn't been done yet. And I was in a great bookstore, Elliott Bay Books, and I, I looked at this, I was looking at a book rack and I saw this collection of short stories, uh, The Lone Ranger and Tonto, Fist Fight in Heaven, which was written by Sherman Alexie, uh, 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 at the time even a fairly well-known Native American writer. And um, I picked it up and it was, you know, funny and sweet and sad and, you know, guys living on a reservation playing basketball, which I played. And I thought, this is really amazing because I'm learning something I've never known before about uh, Native Americans. At the same time, the humanity is the same as me or you or anybody. So it was the connection. It was the humanistic connection, even with a cultural thing that was different. So it made it interesting because it was culturally different. But it, but it, but it touched me in a way that was exactly um, you know, the same as me or you or anybody. It was a humanistic quality. So I contacted him. I had this vibe. I had this feeling. And I found him. He was living out in Spokane at the time. And, you know, we started a relationship which built over a couple years. It took a couple years. And, and then he moved to Seattle. And um, ultimately, it turned into, you know, being the person who produced his, his movie, Smoke Signals, his script, which got developed at the Sundance Workshop. There's a Native American director involved now, a young Native American director, Chris Eyre. And, and it came to me and Sherman said, I trust you. Essentially, I want you guys to produce this movie. And we, found, we put the money together and we made the movie. So it's usually, and you know, every, you know, and Smoke Signals is a seminal event, both commercially and for Miramax at the time and for the Native American community. And besides critical thinking, you know, I think it's my... I generally, if people say, what, what's your favorite? I still say smoke signals first. You know, I do. I mean, smoke signals, um, Mystic Pizza, Critical Thinking, Home Alone. You know, I, I directed a movie too, but I think those four movies are really my favorites. And I just get this, you know, it's this crazy feeling. In the documentaries that I did, I was touched by um, – on Standing Silent, which is about um, sexual abuse in the Orthodox community in uh, Baltimore, it was personal because my brother's Orthodox and he knew this journalist, this Orthodox journalist who had been writing about um, these, unfortunately, these yeshiva rabbis who were, you know, getting in trouble like in the Catholic Church, like the priests in the Catholic Church. And um, I, I knew Phil, I knew, I knew him. And I didn't know I was going to do it. And, and I went to, uh, I was in Florida. Uh, my brother and I were, and Phil together were in Florida just going to spring training, baseball games. And uh, Phil said, oh, you know, I know we're, we, we drove from, from Fort Lauderdale up to Vero Beach. We're going to see a Dodger game. We were early because Phil had to interview a gentleman who had been apparently abused by one of these rabbis when he was younger. And Phil was doing interviewing him as part of a story. He said, do you mind if I take an hour and do this and then we'll go to the game? Yeah, of course. So we dropped Phil off at a Starbucks. My brother and I just drove around for a little bit. We came back and Phil was still talking to the guy. And we said, oh, okay, we'll wait outside. And he said, no, 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 come on over. He introduced us to him. 
And and the first thing I noticed was this sort of, and this is now a guy who's probably in his 40s, and the incident happened probably in his teens. And I just saw this lost look in his eyes. I you, you can feel it with certain survivors, not everybody, but I it just felt this pain. And then he stood up and I shook his hand. And and it was like a <laughs> a night Shyamalan movie. I shook his hand and I felt like uh, uh, you know an electric shock or the, like the transference of energy. Like my hand was almost shaking, and I could feel everything. I didn't. I can't say that I saw like oh my god. Now I see exactly what it wasn't one of those. But I felt his pain. I felt it. I was absolutely stunned. I shook his hand and I had this experience. I walked back, I walked outside like stunned with my brother. We were just, he didn't, nobody noticed this but me. And in fact, five minutes later, Phil walks out, <laughs> who's the guy interviewing him. And he, and he says goodbye to the guy and Phil goes, okay, let's go to a baseball game. You know, and I'm standing there like, and my brother and Phil were almost like, what, what's wrong? And I said, uh, I don't know, but I, I turned to Phil and I said, I have to, I have to make something, a movie or a documentary about this. I can't not do it. Something happened. And I, so uh, I, something always connects. The really good things, they connect. And, you know, they just connect. And Smoke Signals was that way. Even Critical Thinking, I worked on it for 18 years when I first heard about the story of these kids. And I knew the kids when they were just starting college. They had just, they had finished high school, but they were just starting college. And I know them now as, as adults with families, but, you know, because I just, I read about it and I thought, this is a movie. And I have that happen all the time. There, there are things I do, by the way, sometimes I get hired as a producer. So it's not mine. And I try to make sure it's something I, I, I will put everything into, but it's not the same thing as when I discover a story as a producer or a writer or both. That's different, and that's what we're talking about here. And it is this kind of, I don't know where it comes from. You know, it comes from somewhere. So it's like I played baseball, and I was pretty good, and I had a minor league tryout and all that, and, I'm, and I've coached my kids now in Little League, but I, I also, people sometimes say, how would you teach hitting? You know, I mean, you know, people are like throwing the ball at 98 miles an hour, you know, which they didn't do when I was starting, but – you know, how would you teach that whole thing, that hand-eye coordination, that you actually see the ball? And I said, you know what? I, I don't know that I could because I, I can't tell you exactly how I was able to see the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand at a certain speed, time it, and hit it on a consistent basis. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know that I could teach that. It was so innate. So some of this stuff ends up being the same way. Like it hits me. It just hits me. It knocks me on the ground. The documentary Seven Days in Syria, you know, started with I read uh, Janine Giovanni, who's a, a well-known journalist who is a journalist who went to war zones, uh, Bosnia and all of that. And then she spent a lot of time in the Middle East. And she had, I had just read a cover story in the New York Times magazine um, of her um, in Syria. And it was a, you know, it was a New York Times magazine cover story. And in the story, uh, she was visiting, she was staying with a family in Aleppo. And, and Aleppo was a, a terrible war zone. There were snipers. So the kids never came out. They never went outside. They didn't even go outside to like go outside for three seconds. Right. So she, she's with this family. It's nighttime. And she says to the young boy, geez, like, cause she has a young son. How do you, what do you do, you know, to stay busy? And there's no school, you know, the internet's dead, you know, and everything. What do you do? What do you do? And he said, just a second, he went into his room and came back and he had a, uh, a DVD, like a dog-eared either DVD or VHS copy of Home Alone. And he said, I watch this every day. And I'm re I read that article on the beach. I'm sitting on the beach, just minding my own business. And it's about me, right? I mean, it's not about, but you know what I mean? It's about me. It's not about me, but it's about me. And I'm going, 
oh my god i it just knocked me over not just like i felt with the guy in the starbucks on standing silent and i was like i got to find janine i got to do something and that's that thing i get i get that feeling and i found janine who happened to be in new jersey uh, she lived in paris and she happened to be in new jersey visiting her mother that week of all things and we met and that was it we made this documentary so you know I, it, and i have stories now i'm working on both as a producer and writer that have hit me the same way there's a movie i'm doing that's a love story about a israeli woman and a uh, iranian man and it's totally unlikely uh, improbable uh, he's not allowed to bring her to iran and if, and if the Iranians actually knew more, they'd probably kill his family, who's still in Iran. Um, she can't bring him to Israel because he's Iranian and Muslim and the em enemy. Uh, they can't, so they have nowhere to live. So, so I, I said it's called Nowhere in the World. And, and they, they're trying to find a place to live because they love only, and for the crime of loving each other, they cannot find a place in the world to live. They're currently living in Cyprus in a tent basically. And, and I, but I read an article last year and I was like, uh Oh, you know, it was that feeling. It was like, uh Oh. And, and I gotten, I found them through Facebook and everything. And I'm working on the project right now, developing the script with a director an Israeli director and a um, Israeli writer who lives in LA. And uh, we have some funding for it already. And um, that's what happens. That's what happened. It's incredible. It is. It's so incredible. And it, and it makes sense because when we get it on the other end, we feel yeah. as consumers, the beauty, the pain, the sorrow, and that's what, what we get. And that's a pro, I mean, just hearing you talk about how it all comes together is incredible because it's the product that gets produced from everything on your end from the time it's consumed and thinking about all the years of culmination in a project like critical thinking yeah. that is why it hits us in such a powerful way as as somebody who actually gets to watch the end product of a movie so that's mm -hmm. that's really awesome so i have to ask because i'm sure there's some people who are listening that are saying you know they might want to be the next scott rosenfeld <laughs> They might want to get into the entertainment industry today, um, which probably looks a little bit different, but I know you've played a lot of roles mm -hmm. because you've produced, you've written, you've directed, you've acted a little bit. What would you say to that person that says, I really want to break into the industry? What is it going to take for me to be successful? Well, I think you have to be present. And, and present means you have to create a goal, give yourself a, a, a one, two, and five-year plan, decide, and then decide how to get there. You have to be able to find building blocks to get there. You have to, if you want to act, you have to study. You can't screw around and go on, you know, TikTok or YouTube and pretend you're going to get discovered. And, uh, and that means you're a movie star and, and you haven't, you have no training. Some people have done that. I, I just don't believe it. I don't think that sustains and it, it's pretty much proven out most of the time, but you know, I, I and, I, and it, everything you have to, you cannot skip the steps. The thing I usually tell people, you cannot skip the steps. You need to, to almost in a sense, apprentice, you have to learn your craft, whichever depart department or whatever area it is. And you have to build off of that. But you cannot just say, oh, it's the modern era and I can get on YouTube and I'll be, get famous because because so-and-so did. Because they'll say, but but so-and-so did that, right? And there, we know who a bunch of so-and-sos are. It's, they're not bad people. But I, I don't know that I'd call that real talent, you know, real talent. Actors who, are, who, have, who have learned their craft worldwide, you know, whether they're famous, you know, and even if you go to the Robert De Niro's of the world, or even younger people, people who just do what it takes, you know, you have to work hard. It's hard work. Otherwise, you know, the joke is everybody would do it. You know, it's very hard work. And that's why people think they can do it. And they can't because you have to know how to work hard, work harder than somebody, 
Uh, I always say like, get up before everybody else, go to bed after everybody else, you know, all that kind of, that's the kind of thinking you have to have. You can't think, you can be positive. I was always positive. And when people say, wow, you were producing when you were 24, 25, you know, I said, I work for it, you know, and, and yes, it, sometimes it takes people longer, of course. But I said, I, I, I listened, I paid attention. And whether it's producing, writing, directing, acting, you know, you have to find um, how to do the work, put the work in, put the work yeah. in, you know, and athletes say that, you know, every time we talk about basketball players or anybody, you know, we put the work in, we put the work in, we put the work in. The real people do that. The phonies, yeah. the phonies think you can skip over stuff. And there's a lot of people now that think they can skip over stuff. You know, it's just the way it is. Yeah, I know. I've watching the Olympics right now brings me to that. Seeing these athletes yeah. have trained their entire life yeah. for this moment that takes years and years and years to get to. Yep. They spend thousands of hours, you know, getting to to where yeah. they. Yeah, they don't, they don't just wake up and say, I'm going to do the shot put today and uh, tomorrow I'm going to be in the Olympics. You know, they, of course, they, the good ones just work their tails off, you know, which is why I wish people would leave Simone Biles alone. Of course, it's mm. disappointing. I mean, I agree. She's, she's disappointed. I mean, you know, we're all disappointed, but of course she's disappointed. I mean, it goes without saying, she didn't decide to do this ahead of time, you know, and and, you know, there's a lot of factors that went into that. You know, their training changed when the Olympics moved a year. COVID worries, their families aren't. Or there's a lot of stuff that went into it. And, yeah, she, she something happened, but doesn't make her a bad person. You know, it happens. And But all the, look how hard all of them work. I mean, especially the gymnast who, who starts so young, which is, you know, another another thing which is potentially a problem which is why they crack at 24 right because they're yeah, starting yeah. At, at 10 and 12 and oh my god it's too young some you know it some is. people might say it's too young but you know but but all of these people athletes and people who who aspire to do great things um even if they're not in entertainment they work at it they just you know look at the woman i forget her name who's behind the creation of the Moderna vaccine. I've seen mm. pieces on her. And, you know, she came out of, you know, she worked hard to get into school and she had a background like somebody else might have done nothing. And she ended up being one of the world's greatest scientists and actually is almost, you know, one of the handful of people who developed that vaccine. So. Yeah. They, it, it's not overnight, and people tend to think it's easy now, especially entertainment, especially yeah. entertainment. And the TikTok thing is cute, but doesn't mean you're a movie star <laughs> or a television yeah. star. You're just you're, you're a TikTok star. Yeah. And it stops yeah. there, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, Scott, I know you only have a few more minutes because you have another meeting to get to, and I want to respect your time. So I have some quick questions mm -hmm. that will maybe help us learn a little bit <laughs> about things that you're interested in. So there's five of them. We'll see if mm -hmm. we can get through them pretty fast. So um, what was one of the most difficult films that you ever had to produce? Mm. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, I was going to joke and say all of them, but they aren't. Some, <laughs> some are, easy, of course, easier than others. Um, I mean, I don't, there, were, there was one that didn't particularly turn out that well, and it's really not very fun to talk about it, but uh, Smoke Signals was not easy. Um, smoke signals was not easy. You know, we had to shoot, we shot on a reservation, um, in, in, uh, Eastern, um, Western Idaho, uh, the Coeur d'Alene reservation. We shot part of the movie in the city of Spokane, but we shot, the reservation was actually in Idaho and the weather was sort of against us in the beginning. We were fighting a lot of stuff. Um, the, we had to get approval of the, of the tribe. You can't just walk onto tribal ground and say we're shooting a movie. Sherman had been a member 
of a different tribe. And the tribes often, you know, over silly stuff, you know, fight with each other and say, oh, the heck with him. We don't want to support him, right? Or those kinds of things were happening. But we got their approval. We had snow right up until the time we started shooting. Um, and then finally the snow went away. It was, it was, it was where we were staying in our hotel in, in Idaho. The drive to the reservation was almost an hour to get through and around the roads and everything. So it was, it was not, I wouldn't call it easy, but it was so spectacular to be working on this project. And I remember the first day of shooting, uh, the morning of the first day of shooting, somebody came out to bless us from the tribe. And um, the whole crew got around the cast and there was this blessing and it, it actually changed pretty much everything. I mean, it made everybody feel like we're going to be able to do this. So that helped, but you know, it was it, the, the travails of working on the movie and the physical, you know, I mean, home alone had stuff. We were shooting in Chicago at night <laughs> in February, all of the exterior house stuff, uh, was 6 p.m. at night till 6 a.m. in February. So no. that was not fun. And, and not, I, fun. not fun. Not uh, fun. I mean, crazily cold, as you might imagine. So that had some difficulties. And, you know, yeah. you know, th those were the kinds of things. I mean, you know, we had, uh, I've had little uh, actor flare-ups and things like that. You know, <laughs> extremities was difficult, mostly because, Farrah Fawcett had a very challenging role. She had done the play, but this was the first time she was doing it as a movie, and she was stuck in a fireplace for the entire movie, basically, most of the movie, and, and, and then you know had to avenge the guy who put her there. And it was really difficult, really emotionally difficult. So Farrah would call me at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, I don't know if I can come tomorrow. I'm so tired. And you know, It was really hard for her emotionally. It was a difficult movie, and she did a great job. So th there were some emotional hurdles to get through, which were not easy. I'd get to the set, and nobody else knew that Farrah Fawcett, our star, would call me, wake me up at 3 in the morning, and I'd have to report to everybody and say, well, this is what's going on today. We have to watch out. And, and I had to kind of, you know, almost in a sense, take care of her. Um, I have, I've had to do things like that often as a producer. You're, you know, uh, somewhat of a father figure, so... Um, so yeah, you know, those are probably the highlights. I mean, um, critical thinking went pretty well. We had a short shooting schedule. We shot for 20 days, that movie. Um, but, um, you know, we got through it. So those are some of the highlights of, of the tough things. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I know, do you have to run now? Because I could just keep going. <laughs> uh, I can, let's see. Let me just make sure I can, there was something. I don't want to make you late. No, no, it's okay. Um, um, hang on, let me see. Hang on, I can, uh, I'm moving something uh, that was going to be now that, that wasn't hypercritical. So let me just make sure it's moving. Um, yeah, I'm good. Awesome. Because speaking of people, you're, you're mentioning some different people that you worked with. One of my questions for you is when you think of Scott's wish list of a director or actor or actress that is in the works, who is it that you would want to work with as you think of some of, some of your future ideas? Uh, well, directors is, are harder because... I have a, just as a producer, I've seen directors, directors, um, you know, are, are, are usually the thing people in the industry, well, people outside of the industry hear about. Directors at um, film festivals get credit like they, I always joke, like they also sewed the clothing and fed the crew and, you know, that there's nobody else on the movie when, of course, anybody who works on a movie knows it's not really that way. There is a handful of directors who deserve that respect. Unfortunately, I don't believe it's that large a list. It, it may be, you know, 20, or, but it's not 
175. It's just not. Most of them, you know, move furniture around basically. And, and the great ones deserve that respect and, and bring something incredible to a movie. And I watch their movies. But um, so I, I, I think it's more like with directors. You know, I can, you know, I, I, uh, um, I'd want to work. I, I like working with, with, with nowadays with sort of younger directors a lot who, who are building their careers and I can help them and sort of mentor them in a way, but help them find their vision, not tell them my vision, but help them find their vision. So it's not so much a per would I would I have loved at one point in my life to have worked with Martin Scorsese? Absolutely. Uh, crawl, I would have crawled across glass to do that up at the top of the list. Um, so that probably indicates that. But generally, I like fresh people. And, and I'm working with a, you know, director in the Philippines, who I think is amazing, who I think is going to have a brilliant career worldwide, not just in the Philippines. And I like that. Uh, and I'm working with an Israeli director who I think is ready to make, she's made independent movies and ready to make a more commercial movie. Uh, you know, I'm building those kinds of things with really interesting directors who also challenge me, ask me mm -hmm. tough questions. I, I'm not a dictator at all as a producer. Some producers are, I'm not. So, you know, actors, um, I've worked with a lot of great actors and I have great respect for actors and, um, you know, I've been involved in a project with Sam Worthington, who I've grown to find great respect for, even as a writer and director. Um, and, uh, you know, I just like actors who come prepared. That's really young or old. I hope they're prepared because some have gotten lazy and they don't learn their lines. The younger, some of the younger ones think, oh, you don't have to do that anymore. You can kind of like carry a piece of paper around and, you know, I, I like actors to be prepared, you know, quality actors and older actors tend to be prepared. Um, so, you know, um, it's harder to like name a group of people, you know, because I, I there, there'd be a lot of people I'd like to work with, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's more the qualities that you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know obviously movies that you've worked on, and we know some of your favorites, but I would want to know what is one of the movies that are your favorites that isn't one of yours? That if it comes on TV, you're just like, oh, this is it. I got to sit here and watch this. This is one of my classic favorites. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Godfather 2. I love Godfather 1, but I, Godfather 2 is, is just amazing in a different way and saying better doesn't make any difference it doesn't mean i i think it's better but but that's like i mean godfather the original is fantastic too but godfather 2 every time it comes on i promise myself i'm just going to watch three seconds and i'm hooked for you know two and a half hours um <laughs> let's see uh for different reasons and and the movie heat uh michael mann's movie with with de niro and pacino is for some reason is consistently riveting every time it's on. There's also uh, De Niro's movie, Ronin, right? Um, I think Luke, Luke Besson directed it, but Ronin, every time Ronin's on, I have to watch it. Um, uh, let's see, Chinatown. Chinatown's another one. Chinatown gets me, I, I you know, uh, Moonstruck is amazing that way. Um, most of these are not too current either, as you notice. And, you know, they're not, they're not forties and fifties. I, for some reason, I'm not, I, I like some movies from, you know, the thirties, forties and fifties. And, but it's, it just wasn't for some reason, my time period, I could, you know, look, I like Citizen Kane and all of that. I've studied all these movies. Um, mm -hmm. but but the movies that really captured me, you know, Mean Streets, Scorsese's movie, Mean Streets, uh, one of his first, not his first, but one of his first. Um, Hal Ashby, you know, made some great movies, underrated director that some people don't know about, but uh, Shampoo, uh, The Last Detail, they're, they're fantastic movies. Um, if there's a cast of, if it's Woman Under the Influence or Husbands, both Cassavetes, John Cassavetes films that he, 
either acted in or directed and wrote. Um, you know, uh, Fellini, I think the, the movie Amarcord, uh, Fellini's film Amarcord, I like Fellini, but Amarcord is one that makes me stop and watch. Uh, you know, I think, I think it kind of shows the kind of filmmakers I like and um, the list. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I want to just sit and watch movies tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could more. I know, me too. You would think with this pandemic situation, but yeah. I think we fill, we fill our time with more work than probably yeah. leisure things, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have just a few last questions because I want people to get to know you personally, besides the fact that you're an incredible movie maker, as we've seen with, your, with all the work that you've done. Um, so my next question is, Scott, what are three words that best describe you? <laughs> Uh, tenacious, um, thoughtful, and probably caring. Those all come across. So I love those. I love those three words. Okay. What is something that you're working on improving? Uh, I think we can, we can uh, always improve uh, our personal relationships and, you know, just how we are direct with people uh, without hurting their feelings. Uh, I, I'm not a mean person at all. So it's, I'm not saying like, oh, I've been mean before. I'm going to try not to be mean anymore. But, you know, to just cut to the core of it, I think as I get older and I realize people are like beating around the bush about stuff, I just, I don't have the time for it, but we've all done it, you know? You know, and people even say now, oh, don't tell them that or don't say that. And it's not anything particularly like, it's not like I'm going to grab somebody by the, excuse me, the throat and call them a jerk or anything. It's just, <laughs> you know, just being direct, being direct so that you, people go, you know what? He's not wishy-washy. He's not saying something because he wants me to hear it. Um, he, he really likes me or whatever that is, you know, and, and to be, you know, in your own skin, in your own body. I, you know, I've spent a lot of time, um, you know, we all have in our relationships, which is, you know, are we, are we being honest with ourselves? Are we being honest with the other person? And, and there's always room for improvement there. And that's something I've, I've had to work on. You know, I've, I've had my own you know, personal life with, I'll just say different marriages, um, mm -hmm. and you know, you have to, if you don't learn from it, of course, you're going to repeat it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I have children, I have young children and you learn through them too, how to be, and hopefully how to be better. And, and it's really enjoyable. And that's a whole other thing for me as an older person, having young children, you know, of course it's happening more and more in our society that people are having children later. But at the same time, it's still, you know, somewhat rare, depending on where you live. And, you know, I walk around with my kids in a small town where I live and, you know, they're nine and 12 and I'm not 35. So, you know, there's a lot of automatic, uh, oh, your grandkids are so well behaved and that kind of thing. Uh, but I don't worry about that too much. I, I understand, you know, People don't know any better, and it's not really their fault. <laughs> they see a, a guy my age walking around with young kids. But I, I have learned through them, and I have learned, you know, through them and how to be better, you know. And, and uh, so I think on the personal side, it's, it's just how to be authentically yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Working on being direct myself, too. It's not, it's not always easy, you know, no, not a no. conflict of, you know, conflict is not something that um, is my favorite, but you know, sometimes it's, well, that's because you're, that you have to you're Filipino. Confront. 
as you know, as it's, you've been immersed in the culture, it is not something in the way that we're raised uh, yeah. to be dealing with. <laughs> I notice it every day here, uh, both, you know, some, uh, you know, whether it's personal life or uh, business, I, I definitely notice it. You know, it's not endemic to the culture to be like, no, I'm going to tell you exactly what I feel right now. You know, it's not, you know, okay. No. You, you know, it's. <laughs> no. Yeah. Just, just takes a couple Filipinos and throw them in like Jersey and New York, mm -hmm. and then maybe they can, uh, you know, enrich that particular skill set. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. What is a self limiting belief that you've had about yourself that you've had to overcome in life? Uh, well, I, interestingly enough, I, I think it has to do with my father who was successful as we were growing up and put two kids through college, uh, private schools, you know, NYU and University of Pennsylvania with almost no scholarships. My brother had a little one for an Ivy League school. I had none. A lot of money, even back then. Uh, very successful business, but as he, as, thing, as we got older in late 20s and 30s and business started to change and, and he kind of, uh, his business went downhill and, um, and did not, and when he died, you know, there were debts and things like that. And unfortunately, he, he believed in his business and stayed at it too long. And so I do have a little bit of a fear of failure from, like, am I going, it's the same thing going to happen to me that my father went through, who had a, a very strong period of success, which I've also had, you know, in my early and middle part of my career. And as I'm working through this last half of my career or last third, uh, and the business has changed, we don't make movies the same way. Uh, everybody doesn't get hired the same way. The fees we made before are actually less now, mostly, unless you're making $200 million movies, which I don't. So I start to, I, you know, I've felt sometimes like, am I gonna wind up like him? I'm sure we all have that kind of, those kinds of feelings. So I, I, I try to learn from that, what he, what he did, what he did wrong, what I can do better, why it's not necessarily that's the way it's gonna be. And that's probably the one thing that I struggle with or try to work on. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate yeah. to that. All right, two last ones. Um, you've been around the world, many places. What is something that you wanna see changed in the world? I think, you know, putting aside politics, but about people, I've noticed in a lot of the world, there still is too much of a class difference. We don't see it written about that much, but with the countries I spend time in now and other countries I've traveled to, there's, there's a big difference between, um, you know, sort of the upper middle class and the, and the upper class and the lower middle class, if there is one, and the lower class. And I know that there are people in the lower class who feel like no matter what they do, they will never be given the opportunity because the upper class just doesn't want it. They don't want it. They don't want to see all those poor people educated and take over. They don't. I've seen that, you know, in places where I've lived, I see that, you know, the class thing. And, and it's the one thing about the United States, even with the mess we got ourselves into with Trump and, you know, and it's not good. You know, we know it's not good. And even though Biden, I like, and there's things that are getting better, there's things that are a mess too. But there, there, we know that there's an opportunity. You can make it. You're not told. You might be told by somebody who's an idiot, don't try that, or a guidance counselor, right, who says, oh, you should never do that. But you can, you can, you can become successful. There are ways to do that. And there are countries and there are places where, People really feel, nah, they will never let, they will never let us. And mm -hmm. I see that and I feel that uh, in Asia, you know, as much as I like Asia. So I think that's the thing I would like to see different. Even in countries that are technically democracies, there's still a pretty big class distinction. 
and it, it just anything with a class distinction bothers me. I don't like seeing it. I don't like, you know, seeing people feel like they have to walk on the other side of the room when you're walking in the room and you still see that in places, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I don't even it's like being called, being called, sir. You know, I, I don't know what that means. Like, Oh my God, just, I have a name. Right. So yeah. that kind of stuff. I, I yeah. it, it does, buy it just gets to me. It's something I, I don't like. I, I totally understand that. Okay. Last tough question. No, it's not tough. <laughs> What's one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever been given? Uh, hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I've said it before, you know, and, and even earlier, but you know, people early on in my career would say to me, listen, really, when you're in a situation, when you're learning, when you're with people, don't worry too much about what you want to say. Really engage with somebody and listen to what they have to say, because it's the only way really to have a free exchange of ideas and thoughts and feelings because otherwise you're just talking, you know, you're telling people what you think and you want and, and bad actors are that way. The best actors actually really, you know, engage on a level with the dialogue, which is not, you know, their normal dialogue, their characters dialogue, but they actually are listening to the other actor and good actors know that good actors know when other actors are just go looking at them like, you know, whatever they're thinking about, the baseball scores or something, and then they deliver their lines. You know, really good actors sense that, and they get upset by it. And But, you know, I, I think that still holds true, and I still really try to do that because I have business situations where somebody wants to says, no, this is what I want to do. And I said, well, did you actually listen to what they said they wanted to do so that we could tailor – what we need to do based on what what's reality, right? Not imposing your will. So I think that's still the biggest thing. That's awesome. I love that. Scott, how can people follow the work that you're doing? A website or any place online that they might be able to uh, see what's going on with you? There is a website that's my name, you know. Um, I think it's just www scottrosenfeld.com. I also, uh, my company is on Facebook, Cinema Veritas. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, I try to stay current with new stuff. And, you know, recently I hadn't dumped a lot of stuff on there, but I probably will again. And those are probably the two. I mean, I'm on Twitter. I'm not the biggest Twitter person. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, com <laughs> I, I, I commented on something recently. And, and somebody wrote back and said, it's funny, this is the essence of Twitter, which is why I really don't love it. Instead of thinking like, oh, that was a really cool comment, right? Or which I thought it was, and other people liked the comment. This one person said, why should I care about what you say? You only have 250 followers, right? That was their measure. Because I didn't have a lot of followers, it doesn't matter if I was Albert Einstein, they didn't give a hoot what I said. And I thought that was actually obviously pretty goofy. So, um, you know, I like to try to, on one level, I like to try to stay private. Uh, on another, you know, on my website and on Facebook, uh, which I have reservations about, <laughs> but I'm doing uh, business-wise with Cinema Veritas. I, it, you know, it helps. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, uh, let's see. There's some Instagram stuff under my name, but not a lot. I, I don't think, but it's mostly those two professional. Perfect. Yeah. And this, you know, whole thing with social media and the measuring stick of the followers and the likes is pretty yeah. ridiculous. So yeah, no, it's, I, I don't, I don't buy it. I think it's not just for myself. I just think that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous measurement, you know, of who you are or, or what your value is, I should say. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I'm so honored, Scott, to have this much of your time and to learn from you about, you know, something all of us that for those that are listening, um, movies connect us. 
it's kind of like food. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's there's there's certain things in the world, despite vast differences with politics and like you pointed out, socioeconomic classes, something that is so ground mm -hmm. setting or level setting is movies, mm -hmm. you know, no, no matter who you are, it's something that can bring us together. So I, I just appreciate you being in sure. a space that that can uplift us because we need that. <laughs> sure. We certainly need that. So I'm just so grateful for your time. Thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. As they say, salamat. <laughs> Salama, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> it was such an honor to have Scott Rosenfeld, executive movie producer from Hollywood, on the show. So full of rich knowledge, not just about the movie industry, which I could talk about for days with him because he's such a wealth of knowledge, but just about life. I really appreciated his candor and how honest he was about simple lessons that can go such a long way. Listening. What big of a difference it makes when we actually show up and listen to other people. We always have something to say, and there's probably things that we feel very passionate about that we know or are experts in and want to convey and just put out there with the world. But it goes such a long way in terms of relationship building when you can take a pause and be present like you talked about and listen. That transcends all industries, and I'm so glad that he shared that important message. I also love that he talked about being honest and forthcoming and being direct about what it is that you're really thinking or feeling. That's another effective thing in all relationships, right? Whether we're talking about business and making key decisions about who we're going to work with, what projects we're going to take on, and relationships as a whole in our personal life. Are there things that we're holding back or not speaking up on that we really should be articulating and saying regardless of what those consequences are? Think about that for a minute. Is there a conversation that you need to be having with someone that is more blunt, more direct, more honest, but with respect that is going to help to build that better connection and honesty and vulnerability with with somebody in your life right now. And uh, I think there's so much to be said for, again, the movies and the movie industry. And I loved hearing him talk about the thing, that fabric that's hard to put into words of what really draws us to things, whether it's a movie in his realm or just things in general that it's hard to put just one word on it, but what I took away was connection, culture, humanity, the things that transcend race, religion, politics, economics. One of the things that I love is if you ever take the time, speaking of movies, to watch international movies. So movies that are in other languages, uh, and you could use subtitles, whatever continent it's from, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is look at how it makes you feel. And I love watching some international movies, uh, whether it's from Asia or Latin American countries, those are two popular ones for me, is even though we're in different cultures, even though we're across different parts of the world, we have similar experiences and have those same feelings that come up despite different upbringings and belief systems and things like that, which I think is just so beautiful. So check out Scott Rosenfeld. You heard directly from him so many of the different movies that he has in his repertoire. He is a brilliant mind, a brilliant, brilliant mind. And again, critical thinking. Such a fun movie that has a lot of aspects of learning in there. Um, 
from race and socioeconomics, but to hope and inspiration. And uh, yeah, a lot of classic ones mentioned as well. So if you're looking to expand your Netflix or your movie nights now, you've got a bunch of different ideas after listening to this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. It means the world to me. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast right now, um, whether it is YouTube or Spotify or Stitcher or Apple or Audible, whatever it is, uh, just tune in. I want you to tune in every week and share the episode with somebody who might need it. We are in a time right now that is saturated, saturated with distractions and negativity. And if we can take just a little glimpse of our day to add hope and inspiration and motivation to somebody else's life, that is a great gift that you can give. So share this episode with somebody who you think can be inspired by it. And remember, you are your only limit. So take action today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Born Unbreakable podcast. I'll see you again next week for another inspirational episode.